Welcome to the introduction to interoception feelings and behaviour. There are a number of steps involved in learning to manage feelings. The first one of which is to develop interoceptive awareness and then the following that to develop awareness of emotions and feelings as they're developing and once you've done that you can develop practice the skills required to respond to developing emotions at which stage you need co-regulating and then finally you can learn to self-manage and self-regulate. As humans our ability to experience feelings or emotions um, obviously that impacts our behavior is controlled by the interoceptive center of the brain which is in the insula. So interoceptive awareness, it's sometimes known as the eighth sense, um, is the conscious perception of our internal bodily states. So for example, our heartbeat, um, whether our bladder is full or not, how our skin feels, um, how our hormones are feeling. So for example, um, are we feeling attracted to somebody or are we feeling um, not? Um, how are our lungs, so that's our rate of breathing whether our stomach is full or empty, whether our intestines are, f are empty or they need um, emptying, um, if our bones ache or are feeling okay and how our immune system is functioning. So as you can see that's a, a large range of different sensations and each and all of these together um, are our interoceptive awareness. So there are three main aspects around interoception that are the skills required to be able to actually understand ourselves and self-regulate and self-manage. So the initial one of these is the awareness of internal bodily states. So for example, um, do I have a tight throat, do I have sweaty palms, thumping heart, etc. Um, and this is the very base of our embodied sense of self, our awareness of self and how we feel and of our emotions. So those base signals, those feel body signals that we experience, um, we interpret them as emotions and feelings. So two or more um, body signals put together are what create a sense of feeling or emotion. And when you think about your pulse rate and quality, you might actually have a quite high pulse rate and that could signal in itself a range of different feelings and emotions. You could be anxious, you could be excited, you could be scared. So we actually need to have a number of different um, signals put together. Some of the other body signals that you can experience are your muscle and tendon placement and tension, um, hunger and thirst, your body temperature and it's important that we understand our interoceptive awareness is not just the conscious perception of those but also a way of describing them that doesn't need to be um, a spoken description but a way that that we can interpret those and make sense of those so as I said before it's collections of body signals that are interpreted as emotions and feelings um, so if we're feeling sick um, that uses a number of different body signals to tell us that we're feeling sick. Our stomach um, might have a, a sort of gurgly sensation, we might have a rising sensation in our throat and we might be cold and clammy on our skin. Uh, and if we're hungry we still might have a, a, a feeling in our stomach but it could be quite a different feeling and we might have a sort of uh, a sensation in our throat that's quite different to when we're feeling sick. The third aspect to interoceptive awareness that we need when we're thinking about being able to self-manage and self-regulate, so once we've already got an awareness of our internal body states and an awareness of our feelings and emotions, is actually that awareness of the impact of external stimuli on ourselves. So for example, we've all been outside when it's hot and seen um, children and adults who are dressed in sweaters and if they're asked aren't you hot they say no and the thing is that they don't actually feel hot so their body is hot but they don't have that feeling of being hot because their interoceptive awareness around temperature is not accurate and if we also think about people who are 
dressed in puffy coats when it's not cold if you ask them aren't you hot you know why, why are you wearing a puffy coat they'll say oh they're feeling cold um, and it might not be that they're actually cold it's just that they don't have a very accurate um, temperature awareness so this is also known as um, poor thermoregulation so I have very poor thermoregulation and I inaccurately feel very hot quite a lot of the time um, but if I actually put my hands on my feet my feet can be very cold and in fact can be blue and I'm thinking that I'm hot now when we think about our emotional feelings and our, and our sense of um, how we are feeling within ourselves these are actually directly related to our sense of embodied self so our sense of who we are and um, how we exist so that representation of our body signals and the the meta representation of the state of the body in the brain is giving us a subjective mental image of ourselves and um, so this is known as the embodied sense of self um, which if you're interested in this you can find out more by reading Bud Craig's work so the bunyips in the picture uh, you know what am I I'm a bunyip well if we think about ourselves we can say well what am I well I'm a human being or I'm for me I'm Emma but that encompasses you know I have a body that has two feet two hands um, I know that my hands are on the end of my arms and so on and so forth so this is a, a developmental trajectory um, babies when they're born they don't have an embodied sense of self and they they discover it and as they are discovering it they tend to start at the extremities and work in so they discover their hands first and they'll do things like waving their fingers around uh, putting their fingers in their mouths but interestingly at this stage they can't always tell the difference between their fingers and your fingers and sometimes they'll grab your fingers and put your fingers in their mouths thinking that it's their fingers so, so let's link this together very practically if you think about how you feel right now if you could not use the feeling or emotion words to describe your feeling or emotion and you instead had to describe your bodily state your internal bodily states I might say for example that my throat is tight and my chest is tight and my hands were clammy now if you think about what emotion that or feeling that that could represent it might be that not all of you have the same interpretation and that's okay because we actually tend to layer our experiences of emotions and feelings onto other people some people for example feel their tension and their stress in their shoulders but others feel it in their neck or in their back um, and unless we know that about the person we would just expect that they would be the same as us so if you want to just write down how you are feeling um, in terms of your internal body states so if you're feeling a bit tired don't use the word tired think about where in your body is signaling to you that you are tired is it for example that your eyes are heavy or is it that your body has a particular kind of tension or relaxation um, that you are slumped or heavy all these kinds of things now if your interoception is atypical um, you will have struggled with that previous activity of how do you feel and some of the interesting aspects around atypical interoceptive awareness are that not only does the person um, not connect to those internal body sensations that signal their feelings and emotions but they will also have facial expressions and body language that don't match how they would be feeling if they knew how they were feeling so for example if I am given some very sad news I may not have a face that expresses sadness and this might be because 
I don't actually know that I'm sad. Um, if we think about pain, if somebody falls over and hurts themselves, if they don't have a sensation of pain because they don't have that interoceptive awareness for pain, their body will not portray that they are in pain, even though internally they are suffering and there is the signals going from the area of damage to their brain signaling that there is damage. They're not interpreting that because they're not noticing it. So they can't respond to it. Um, motor movements and motor planning can also be atypical in people with atypical interoceptive awareness and because communication via speech is motor movement and motor planning that can also be impacted. So the complicated diagram is the um, aspects of speech broken down. But if you think about how you move your mouth and teeth and tongue to make sounds that can be impacted um, by your feelings and emotions. So we often change our tone of voice if we are feeling a particular way and it may be that that doesn't happen if you don't know that you're feeling a particular way. And on a really base level when somebody says how do you feel what they're asking is how do you feel and the question is for people with atypical interoception how do I feel um, because I'm not sure how I know how I would feel how do I actually that process of feeling experiencing that feeling how does one do that as a result if you have atypical interoception you may be portraying something um, to other people that you're not aware of at all so an interesting example is um, resting bitchy face where somebody can look like they're very grumpy or unkind um, and yet they're an absolutely lovely person who might be quite happy but the way that they are holding their facial um, muscles and um, mouth in particular is interpreted by those around them in quite a different way. We also see people who can appear to be quite timid but they might think that they're quite brave and vice versa. So it's just a very interesting aspect that if your embodied sense of self is atypical that you can also feel quite fractured and quite disconnected to yourself and therefore to other people around you. As I've said, your embodied sense of self is um, developed as your interoceptive awareness develops and if that embodied sense of self is incomplete, you're actually having an internal level of awareness of self as someone much younger, for example about 18 months old. And what we see is that there's such a disconnect between the age and um, way of being of a person and their connection to internal self that interpretations of behavior and um, emotions can be quite wrong. Um, so a young person may be hitting themselves on the chest and people around them are interpreting that as self-harm and it can turn out to be that that young person doesn't have an embodied sense of self, is not connected to themselves and not feeling themselves, so they are actually hitting themselves on the chest in order to be able to feel because if you up the level of biofeedback enough then you can start to feel, so whereas most people can feel their chest muscles if they stretch and tighten them if you have a very poor interoceptive awareness of your chest muscles, that wouldn't be the case. But if you hit them very hard, the biofeedback is strong enough and you can feel that. We also see um, children and young people on the autism spectrum particularly who might do things like hurl themselves into a wall or throw themselves on the floor. And many times they're doing this not to be naughty or obnoxious or self-harming, 
but because it's creating enough biofeedback for them that at that point they feel they exist because if you don't feel you don't exist on one level so a lot of these behaviors to drive high biofeedback are perceived as challenging um, another area that kind of results in challenging behavior for people with poor or atypical interoceptive awareness is when their sympathetic nervous system response is atypical so they are responding to perceived threats that aren't actually threats it were driving driven by survival behavior and we will cover that more in um, part two so how do, do we as professionals as family members um, support workers etc know if a person has an incomplete or a complete embodied sense of self how do we know if they are fundamentally not connected to self and so developmentally in that aspect um, very young so we're bearing in mind that if you don't have good interoceptive awareness you don't feel yourself you don't you're not connected to yourself you're not aware of how you feel and if you're not aware of those things how can you possibly connect to others in a way that is um, deep and empathetic and relational in addition how is it possible to self-manage or self-regulate if you don't know when you're getting angry you don't know when you're hungry or when you're thirsty um, interoception is atypical not just in autistics um, but also in people who've experienced trauma and that includes people who have not themselves experienced trauma but have um, parents or grandparents who have experienced trauma because the brain changes due to due to trauma are passed on to the children of those people and also in um, a range of other neurodevelopmental differences interoception is atypical and one of the main um, ways that you can tell somebody has atypical interoception is that they go from 0 to 100 in a split second which can sometimes look like a huge explosion of externalizing behavior so what do I mean by a hundred um, some of the other ways that that's phrased is flip your lid or losing the plot or um, a sympathetic nervous system overload uh, meltdown or shutdown and all of these things uh, are often perceived by people um, as challenging behavior particularly if they are unaware that the individual has um, very little or very atypical interoceptive awareness there are some other common interoceptive issues that can lead to challenging behavior or presentations of behavior that are challenging for other people uh, many people with atypical interoception have a lack of awareness of thirst of hun or hunger and there's been some interesting research at the University of Southern Queensland on thirst and autism and what they found is that many autistics either overdrink or underdrink because they don't have a sense of thirst so that if they overdrink it's because um, they've learned to drink but they haven't learned to drink to regulate hydration or thirst they just know that they should drink every so often and um, on the other hand some autistic people just don't drink very much at all and can be quite significantly dehydrated a lot of the time now dehydration can also lead to constipation or worsen existing constipation and people who are constantly dehydrated can have a range of issues then headaches which they may or may not be aware of depending on their interoceptive awareness of pain um, and agitation distress because it's not good for our bodies to be constantly dehydrated and challenging behaviors can increase in um, people who are dehydrated because they're 
stress levels in their brains are higher because their brain is distressed and needs to be given water. So there's an interesting case study on um, hydration in South Australia. Special classes and some mainstream classes were introduced to urine charts. Um, not this particular one. They used one from a healthcare company and teaching was explicitly linked um, to the colour and smell of urine and how that related to hydration and body and brain health. So over a period of about a term, children and young people were able to self-regulate their hydration. They were able to know when they were hydrated and when they needed to drink and they were willing and able to drink water in order to increase their hydration. What was very interesting about this was that behaviour issues in those classes and preschools significantly decreased as the children and young people were better hydrated. Prior to the introduction of the urine charts, um, most of the children and young people thought that urine should be yellow and that it smelt like we. Um, and they learned that it should be almost clear and that it shouldn't smell at all. Uh, where some of the children and young people had not been toilet trained yet and the school or preschool was struggling to assist them to become toilet trained, they found that as the children and young people were more fully hydrated, it was much easier for them to feel when their bladder was full and therefore they were more able to know when they needed to go to the toilet which made toilet training much more accessible. There had been some data collected a few years ago in the South Australian health system which indicated that constipation was the number one cause of challenging behaviour in children and young people on the autism spectrum presenting to a particular health service. And one of the interesting things about that is that many of those children and young people did not actually know that they were constipated because they weren't aware of what um, bowel motion should look like but not only that they weren't actually in presenting as if they were in pain so they did not know that they were in pain constipation um, impacts all bowel habits impact on our personal and care our physical and mental health but where a child or adult is um, toilet trained their families or their support workers or professional um, caregivers and um, other related professionals don't know whether or not they're constipated unless the person themselves is aware of what a normal um, bowel motion should look like versus a problematic bowel motion that needs treatment and support. A lot of um, schools, preschools and residential um, organizations see poo behavior but mostly it's a symptom so where a person uh, is flicking poo or is smearing quite often upon investigation that person has got constipation and what they've been doing is trying to help the poo out because it's stuck and then they have poo on their fingers which they don't like so they're trying to get rid of. This kind of behavior um, impacts on the individual themselves but also their family and extended network and if we treat the underlying constipation we can actually eradicate any of the behaviours that had accompanied it and this has happened time and time again. So challenging behaviour probably goes alongside constipation because it's very painful and even where somebody doesn't have the interoceptive awareness of pain, the constipation is stressful on the body and on the brain and therefore um, the person's sympathetic nervous system is more heightened and therefore they will go into overload more quickly. It can also be life-threatening so constipation should always be given um, the appropriate medical treatments or a referral should always be made to the medical system. Um, a person's GP is the first port of call but if the person is already so constipated it may be that they need to go to hospital to be de-impacted. Constipation impacts ability to focus and learn as well as well-being and 
when you have good interoceptive awareness for your bowels you often can tell when you are constipated and you will do something about it very quickly if you don't you don't do something about it it becomes um, more and more serious and impacts on your well-being and your um, behavior more and more significantly so as we have um, covered atypical interoception has significant behavioral and well-being implications when individuals are hyper or hypo interoceptively aware and responding to that their communication can often present in ways that are perceived as challenging or naughty um, too hard to deal with and this is particularly the case if the people around them are not aware of their communication style in the first place but also the significant role of interoceptive awareness in behavior so where we are working with um, individuals or where we are family members of individuals who have behaviors that can be perceived as challenging one of the first things we should be looking at is how is their interoceptive awareness do they know when their bladder is full do they know when they need to go to the toilet um, are they aware of when it's hot and they should take jumpers off or when it's cold and they should put jumpers on um, do they go from zero to a hundred in a split second because that is another indicator that somebody um, has atypical interoceptive awareness because when we have good interoception we are aware of our feelings and emotions as they start to get more and more intense and usually what we do is we do something about it so somebody who has very good interoception will tend to know when they're starting to get hungry for example and they might eat a snack if it's outside of meal times whereas somebody that doesn't have good interoceptive awareness for hunger may not eat until they're extremely hungry or they may not ever notice that their body needs food and might become quite significantly unwell over time due to lack of um, food intake <laughs> 